gospel ministry that's been called to speak with a prophetic voice to the men of this generation and commissioned with a ministry majoring in men. Our call and our commission is to declare a standard for manhood, and that standard is that manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. Being a male is a matter of birth. Being a man is a matter of choice. Today you're going to hear from a man who's called of God to do one of the most important works in our generation to clean up the media and to make an impact upon our society. You're going to be hearing Mr. Ted Bear, but from right now, for right now, from all of us that are here to you right there, we welcome you to the meeting and here comes Mr. Ted Bear. All right, let's give him a hand, guys. All right. You know, I was thinking last night what made this ministry so effective. And um, I think what it is is that Dr. Cole, Ed, has such humility that he's willing to open himself up and open up his heart to us and uh, share with us. I'm going to start out again with 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every vain imagining, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Well, you know, I usually like to start out with a test, and I gave you a little test yesterday, and you got some of the questions correct. Uh, it's from Fabulous Fallacies, but just to establish this for the videotape, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago called Fabulous Fallacies, more than 300 popular beliefs that are not true. And I think tests start us thinking about the world. Of course, not everybody in the world is going to get all these questions, but the first question was, everybody knows that blood is red, and your answer is? No, no it's blue. Right. Why does it turn red? Oxygen. Oxygen. Great. Now, um, everybody knows that St. Patrick is Irish? No. You guys are great, Scottish, okay. And the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th? No, second, okay. But who was the first president of the United States? Come on, there's somebody who's been, what? No, you came close. It sounds like John Hamilton, you came close. Okay, very important that we're able to see through the fallacies of our age. And uh, what I pointed out is that I've given this test at many places. I gave it at CNN, and they did not get one question right because Paul Ryden told me that he didn't understand the meaning of the word fallacy. And one part of our ministry, which we've inherited from the church, it was very successful. Uh, it's a strategy that we did not invent. It's a strategy that was used for many years to keep movies and television programs clean. It was a strategy of going into the media and helping the people in the entertainment industry to understand the truth that would set them free from the fallacies of this age. Now, we've done that on several cases. For instance, uh, we went into Turner Broadcasting when they were doing a lot of pro-abortion type programs and people were mumbling and grumbling about it. And uh, I remember pastors just telling me how much they hated Ted Turner. In fact, I went over to a friend's house, and on his refrigerator was the four men that he hated most in the world. It came from some Christian publication. And one was Ted Turner and Ted Kennedy and Norman Lear. And I can't remember who the fourth was, but he had been throwing darts at it. And so we went in to talk to the head of documentary programming from Turner Broadcasting. And as I said, she, uh, she said she would never, never, never change her mind on this issue on the issue of abortion. She was very strong about it. She was a feminist. She was co-founder of the Better World Society. Uh, she had been Ted Turner's mistress. She was very strong about her goals. And four days later, she said she changed her mind on the issue. And uh, when she did, she said, I'm canceling a pro-abortion program, and I'm going to put on the pro-life spots from the DeMoss Foundation. And then an article came out in Premier Magazine saying, now Planned Parenthood is crying foul, claiming that Turner Broadcasting has unfairly taken sides. And she wrote me a letter and said, I have so much gratitude to express to you that a mere letter seems like an inadequate way to convey the depth of my appreciation for your ministry. Discipling me as you have these last 18 months has given me a discernment of the principles of the gospel that is now and will continue to carry through 
in all the programming I develop for the Superstation. I'm certain the effects will be felt by many millions of our viewers at home and in the 117 countries we syndicate our programming to. And as a matter of fact, at Turner Broadcasting now, you have about 110, maybe 120 people, top executives who have become very serious Christians, who meet in fellowship groups, who are really interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what we've seen in the last few years since we've been lobbying the industry is we've seen the industry become more sensitive to the issues. We've seen the industry confess that it has a problem. We've seen the industry produce more family programming. We see people every day coming to me and talking and saying, we want to stop producing sex and violence. How do we uh, make more uh, elegant films? Fred Roos, who did Secret Garden, uh, he came to me at dinner and he said, I want to take you to dinner. He said, I started out producing The Black Stagion, and then I got into all this sex and violence because that's what Hollywood told me I had to make, and I just want to make more family films. I own the right to all The Black Stagion. How do I do it? And of course, underneath his question is, is there an audience for the good, the true, and the beautiful? Now, this strategy that we have of going into Hollywood and talking to the Rupert Murdochs, the owners, Rupert Murdoch, I guess, is the most powerful man in communications today, followed closely by John Malone. He just bought the satellite that's over China and India, so he controls most of the broadcasting over Asia and over Africa and much of it over England and Europe, and he started out in Australia. So here's a man who affects the lives of billions of people. You know, whoever controls the media controls the culture. He dictates what they see and what they hear and what they want to emulate. He sends them programming that they want to copy, MTV and Madonna and whatever. So this is an extremely important strategy, trying to get these men to not only know Jesus Christ, but to be discipled. Rupert Murdoch accepted Christ uh, four years, five years ago now. And, but to get them to, to really grow in the faith and be discipled. And it's a strategy that we, as I said, didn't invent. It came to us from the old Protestant film office. During many years, during the golden age of Hollywood, when Mr. Smith went to Washington, and it was a wonderful life, and the bells of St. Mary rang out across the land. The reason that movies were so wholesome was that the church was deeply involved through the Protestant Film Office and the Roman Catholic Legion of Decency. You could not make a film without the approval of the church. You could not get a film out without the motion picture code seal of approval. And then in the mid-1960s, the church retreated from Hollywood. 1966, they closed down the Protestant Film Office, and the head of the Motion Picture Association of America said the reason that 90% of the people in the world go to Hollywood movies is because they know they can take their families without being embarrassed. James Cagney, the worst gangster is James Cagney or Edward G. Robinson has never used the slightest profanity, words that you might hear in your everyday life. And within six months of the church closing down the Protestant Film Office, Newton Dieter opened up the Gay Lesbian Task Force Office and copied the whole mandate that had been developed by the Protestant Film Office. There's a book out called Par Target Primetime, and it's about all the groups that came in to deconstruct, to demoralize, to immoralize uh, Hollywood, to take Hollywood and transform it. And it was written by Catherine Montgomery, who's a professor at UCLA, and she used to work with the uh, Gay Lesbian Task Force, started out as a researcher there, and she counts all of the successes that they had Successes that they would not have had if the church had not abandoned Hollywood. So the state we find ourselves in today is because the church retreated. The church left the mission field. And because the church left the mission field, the adversary and others, I mean, even the Church of Satan set up a Hollywood film office. And two years after that, in 1968, there was the first sex and Satanism film, Rosemary's Baby. And Anton LaVey, who's head of Church of Satan, actually played a part in the film. He's the little guy at the end of the film. For anybody who's seen Rosemary's Baby, has anybody seen it here? Yeah, yeah a couple. He's the little guy who goes up and tickles the, the chin of the Antichrist. It's, uh, it's good old Anton LaVey. And uh, the Gay Lesbian Task Force got their first film made, which was Midnight Cowboy, X-rated film, where the bad guy is a minister who, who gets the cowboy from Texas to become a homosexual. And one bad film after another, one bad TV program after another, came out of groups that were lobbying Hollywood from a paganistic point of view, from a satanic point of view, from a homosexual point of view. 
None of it would have happened if the church left, if the church had not left Hollywood. So what we do on one side is to go in and talk to the media. It's an extremely important ministry. Some people ask me, why did the church ever leave Hollywood? Anybody have any ideas? Save money. That's right. They were spending $36,000 a year for the Protestant film office. It was too much money. The churches that were involved were everybody from the Church of God to the Southern Baptist Convention to the Lutheran to Presbyterian Episcopalian, and they could not continue to support the Protestant film office for $36,000 a year. They, uh, they pulled the plug to save a few shekels. And instead of becoming fishers of men, they became garters of the treasury. They became protectors of the purse. And of course, uh, when I was head of one of the big denominational uh, film departments, we did The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I remember the church at that time, because I was on the board of an organization that many people don't like, the NCC, and I watched as the church retreated from all sorts of missions fields. And the head of NBC came in and said, you know, we've given you time on 1,800 radio stations, and you've abandoned it. We've given you time on... On television, you abandoned it. Every year, they would abandon these, these territories to the adversary. The church has been in retreat for the last 20 years, 25 years. So what we do is go in and talk to the executives and reestablish that liaison and read scripts. I just got a letter from the man who's producing Lassie. He said, I want you to read the script and tell me whether you think that it's going to be acceptable for Christian audiences. I got a man who's a Jewish man who's producing Red Scorpion 2. He said, I want to subscribe to your motion picture code. I want you to tell me whether it's going, the script that we have will, will work. I got a letter from a man who's, who's producing uh, some other feature films. He says, I'd like you to put a person on our film to make sure that the film meets the criteria of the motion picture code. Uh, day after day, I get calls from people in Hollywood. The person who's producing the commish called last week and he said we're doing a scene with Christians and we want to make sure that we don't alienate or offend Christians. We'd like you to put a theologian on call to make sure that the scene is going to work. So that's part of what we do. But the more important part that I've found over the last few years is not Hollywood. Hollywood is on the verge of change. It's a very small community. There are only a hundred key decision makers in Hollywood. And if John Malone has his way, there will only be one key decision maker in Hollywood. It'll make my task a lot easier. But there are not a lot of people who can actually sign the check in Hollywood, who can actually okay the project. It's a small community. And there are 60 primetime TV shows. There are 44 executive producers of those shows. 13 now of them are Christian. It is not a large mission field. But in the church, I find the biggest problems today. And it's not just the church in, uh, in the United States. It's not just the liberal church. It is the hardcore evangelical conservative churches where you find that the people are not being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, but they're being conformed to the images of Hollywood. And the problem that we have is that the parents really have lost track of who their children are and what their children are watching. If you're an adult, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, you only watch uh, maybe six movies a year, and 80% of them are family films. Actually, adults do not spend a lot of time entertaining themselves. They spend more time working and trying to support their families, and uh, it's the children who are addicted to the media. The average teenager watches 50 films a year in the theater and 50 films a year at home. It means 100 films a year. 80% of them are R-rated films. 90% of the Christian teenagers have seen hardcore pornography by the time they're 17 years old. 70% of them say that they want to copy what they see. 31%, according to Dr. Victor Klein, or 40%, according to Moody Bible Institute, have copied what they've seen. In other words, they've had group sex or they performed reverse sex act before they're 17 years old. You know, and the problem with that is that we now have teenagers that are being lost. They're not only losing their innocence, but they're losing their health. 4,000 teenagers come down with a sexually transmitted disease every day in the United States. Of course, 2,000 come down with a, with a pregnancy, uh, unmarried pregnancy. 1,000, 1,200 1, 1, uh, teenagers in the United States come down, have an abortion every day in the United States. 
160,000 teenagers go to school with a gun every day in the United States. The teenage suicide rate, the teenage murder rate, is just growing in a tremendous rate. And most of it is being influenced by what they see. And the parents are clueless. When I talk to teenagers and parents and I ask the teenagers, uh, have you seen people under the stairs? Have you seen Stephen King's latest movie, Sleepwalk, or whatever else? The teens will describe with gruesome detail uh, the scenes of cannibalism, the scenes of incest, the scene, the pornographic the group sex scene. And the parents from the hardcore or committed Christian churches will just be shocked at what their teenagers have seen, but they had no clue of what their kids were watching. I spoke at a Southern Baptist uh, college the other day. I asked the teens, how many of you have seen pornography for the 17? Every hand went up and up, fresh face, little children, these beautiful girls. How many of you have sex to what you want to see? Every hand went up and up. How many of you want sex after you watch this program? All the hands went up and up. It is a serious problem. The church is being conformed to the images of Hollywood. Total murder. And I'm an educator here at the end of the TV department, City University of New York, New York. Through three ways, they learn to model and behavior. Now, what children do is they watch television. They see 40,000 hours of television by the time they're 17 years old. They go to school for 24,000 hour hours. They spend 2,000 hours with their parents. We usually don't have very much time to interact with their parents a lot less time than that. So, where, so where do they, they get behavior? Model or for They get a television. Who is the model they made under all the television for? But the very children, it's BBs and side by heads, the senses, it's rebellious and antagonism, it's all in the same part of our age. Two, repetition shaping, well, well, the way is you keep it here, they'll still see 400,000 sex acts by the time they're 17, 200,000 acts of violence, and 1833,000 murders on BB by the time they're 17. I don't know about many of you, but when I grew up, I didn't see any murders when I was a child. And yet these, these kids are being inundated with murder orders. One, one boy, boy the other day, a young, young teen teenager, decided, decided to be down on and decided, decided to walk over and see what he was like to kill somebody. And in the neighborhood, over 400,000 dollar houses in Milwaukee, and in Minneapolis, excuse me, walked walk over, saw a woman sitting in her office at 6 a.m. in the morning, morning held, held a gun there for four or five, five or seconds. He actually just held it over their head, threw it through the window, and then blasted her away. Another, Another boy watched watch a Robocop on TV. And he babysitter told him to turn, turn it off. He got his father's gun and shot a babysitter. There are case after case, incident after incident, where they have seen this behavior and they repeat and replicate. 22% of teenage crime is copying what they see down to the nth detail. In other words, if they watch a movie about a girl being raped with a Coke bottle, the next thing you find is that they're trying to rape some of a little 12 or 13 year old girl with, with a broomstick. That was an actual case. They're, they're copying the crimes down to the minute detail of what they see through the media. And the church is ignorant. The parents don't know how to deal with this. The clergy is unaware of what's going on. It's one of the biggest problems that we face today. You know, I told everybody yesterday, and since we're doing it on video, I hate to do it again, but I will. When I was talking at UVA Law School, it's very important to understand that children go through different stages of growth. They do not see the world. One of the problems that parents have is that they've become desensitized to the media. They don't understand how sensitive their kids are to what they see. And um, when I was at UVA Law School, there was one of the law students whose wife had a little toddler with them, and the toddler was running around, and the toddler picked up an exacto knife. Now, toddlers are in what we call as I said yesterday, the sensation stage of cognitive development. That means they learn through their senses. They learn through tasting and touching and feeling. Everything they get their hands on, they put in their mouth. So this toddler was about to put this X-Acto knife in his mouth. An X-Acto knife is a, is a long, thin thing with a razor blade on the end, which could have easily killed or maimed or mutilated the toddler. And as he did it, his mother screamed and grabbed the X-Acto knife and then started lecturing the toddler. And it was the best illustration I could have possibly had for my talk. Because I said, you did the exact right thing by taking away the X-Acto knife. But lecturing the toddler won't do any good because the toddler doesn't understand the logic of your argument. The toddler doesn't understand the consequences of that action. If you leave that X-Acto knife out there tomorrow or the next day, he'll pick it up again and try to put it in his mouth. 
If you put carrot sticks out and razor blades, he'll pick up the razor blade. That's just the nature of toddlers. As a parent, you have to protect the toddler. You have to lock the medicine cabinet. You have to keep the knives and matches and other things away from the toddler. It's some of the basic common sense things that we've forgotten how to do as parents. The next stage for children is the imagination stage. And again, that is a very vulnerable stage. Now, when you move from one stage to another, you forget what that previous stage was like. My son, Robbie, when he, about a year and a half ago, was scared by a thunderstorm in, uh, in Atlanta. It was a very serious thunderstorm, and he was scared. He was sobbing. My son, Pierce, said, Robbie, don't worry about it. It's just a thunderstorm, which, of course, showed that Pierce, who was 12 years old, no longer could relate to where Robbie was in his development, in his cognitive or mental development. And then when I turned uh, around, Pierce started saying to Robbie, Robbie, uh, you know, I think God is angry at you, and that's why we have this thunderstorm. And I quickly uh, took that under control and told Pierce that he better watch out about that. But children that move into the imagination stage, if you remember that stage, if your little girl or little boy has ever wanted to climb in bed to you and say, Daddy, I think there's something in my room at night. My little five-year-old girl did that the other night. She said, Daddy, I think there's something in my room. And I said, don't worry, God's in your room. And she looked around the corner and she said, God, if you're here, don't move because I'm going to be scared. <laughs> it's very important to understand that what they're seeing in the media affects the way they look at reality. I told Pierce after he'd done this with my son Robbie, I said, remember when you had a little friend over when you were nine years old, little Chris, and little Chris had nightmares all night long. And he screamed out in the night. And the next day I prayed with him and I talked to him and I said, Chris, what's wrong? And he said, well, my father took me to a movie called Total Recall. And there was a scene in Total Recall where Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots his wife and says, consider that a divorce. And that scene was very scary to Chris. And I called the father and I said, you know, you probably shouldn't be taking him to R-rated movies. He's just nine years old. His mind is not equipped to what he deals. Has anybody ever taken their child here to, to a teenager to a young child to an R-rated movie? No, this is a good, oh, one or two, okay, <laughs> okay. But, you know, he was totally oblivious. He said, no, Chris and I, we go out hunting. We have fun together. Chris and I talked about the film. He, he wasn't scared by the film. And three months later, the father called me and he said, now I understand that Chris was traumatized by the film. He has been doing poorly in his work. He's been worried about divorce. In his mind, divorce will always be associated with this shooting of Arnold Schwarzenegger of the woman. And of course, Chris sees the world differently than the father does. The father is desensitized. Every adult that you tell the story to laughs at that scene in the movie. It is a funny scene for adults, but it's not a funny scene for nine years old. And what I'm trying to get across to parents, uh, to fathers especially, is that they have to protect their children. You know, I told Chris's father, I said, this is a little bit like Adolf Hitler when he put the young men on the front line of the war against Stalin uh, when he was running out of troops and the front men were just, the young teenagers were just used to absorb the bullets. These kids aren't old enough to deal with the information that they're seeing. These kids have to be protected. They don't have the cognitive, the mental, and the spiritual equipment. You have to protect them. So that's the issue that we're dealing with. We're dealing with parents who don't understand their children, and we're dealing with children who are being conformed to the images of Hollywood. And I say this not in a way that they just wear Madonna t-shirts, which they do. Not just that they have Simpson posters up in their room. Not just that they talk about Beavis and Butthead. I'm saying that their whole behavioral patterns has been influenced in a very immoral and negative way by what they see and that these images lock into their brains and condition the way they're going to relate to reality for the rest of their lives. That these children have been corrupted. Their innocence has been stolen from them. It's almost as if you have a computer and you've inserted a computer virus into their brains. Dr. Victor Klein says that when we get excited, adrenaline goes into our brains and we lock those images into our brains. And what are the images of excitement that these kids have seen the images of group sex and cunnilingus and fornication and uh, all of the things that are going to corrupt them later and make it impossible for them to form, according to the leading psychologists and psychiatrists, viable relationships. Now, as Christians, we don't believe that that's true. We believe that through the grace of God, 
that those kids can be delivered from those images. But when I talk in churches, we'll have kids come up. You know, the parents will usually hang back. We've never been affected by the media. No, no, not us. But the kids will come up crying and weeping from what they've seen. And it is a serious problem. I say to the mothers, how many mothers out there would uh, want, to, and I know mothers are not going to see this tape, but they, they, maybe they should, how many mothers would hire a babysitter who would strip in front of their children? How many mothers would hire a babysitter who would maim or mutilate? And yet mothers every day in the United States of America, Christian mothers, use the TV to babysit their children. How many of your wives have used the TV to babysit their children? They should never use the TV to babysit their children. Amen. Those characters on the TV would never pass your test of what a babysitter's criteria should be. And the father should never take children to see R-rated films. They should never sit there late at night watching films saying that my reward for being grown up is that I get to watch sex and violence on Showtime or on TV or on HTV or MTV or whatever else it happens to be. You have to set an example for your children. Amen. So let, what can we do? Let me briefly give you some answers. The problem is clear, but the problem is that many people are unaware of the problem. Even though there's the Michael Medveds out there talking about the problem, Bob DeVos is, DeVos is talking about the problem, Pat Robertson is talking about the problem. Again, the church community as a whole seems insensitive to it. I just met with some teachers, 800 teachers up in Minneapolis, and the parents seem to be oblivious to what's happening to their children. So the first step in solving this problem is to understand what the problem is. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You must understand the nature of the enemy that you're fighting. This is a very insidious enemy. While the church is still preaching behind a pulpit and using 16th century technology to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ, the adversary, as I said, is dropping smart bombs down through the cable systems into the minds of our children and destroying those minds, implanting demonic images, which is corrupting our youth. Amen. The second step for you to understand is that the children then have to be given a chance to be delivered from these images, that they have to be cleansed. You know, now the good news about this is that the majority of children want less sex and violence in the media. A poll from MTV, no less, said that 92% of their listeners wanted less sex and violence, the teenagers. A poll from Dear Abby said that 33,000 teenagers said they wanted less sex and violence. Only 160 said they wanted more. A poll from George Bonner said that over 90% of the teenagers wanted to watch less sex and violence. So what's the problem? Why would there be a problem if they want less sex and violence? Because we have not equipped them with the intellectual tools, with the spiritual tools, with the cognitive tools to resist temptation. As they walk by the newsstand or as they go up to their hotel room or as they see the, the chance of seeing pornography, they get tempted into it, they get peer pressured into it, they get chided into it. There are all sorts of pressures on them that are dragging them. Have you seen Beavis and Budhead tonight? If you're not, you're out of it. It's not a question of wanting to see Beavis and Butthead. It's a question of all the pressures. And then once they see it, they become addicted to it. They become emotionally aroused by it. And as Dobson talks about with women in secondary virginity among these little teenagers, you know, once they've done it, they feel guilty about doing it. And they want to have to go back to being innocent, to being virgins. But then they get pushed into it again and again. It's the society, it's the families, it's the parents, it's the church that has to protect them. So first you have to make, give them the opportunity to make a commitment to say we're only going to see the good and reject the bad. You have to give them a moment of decision, a point where they can choose this day who they will serve. So we provide a pledge form for them to say, we pledge, we commit ourselves to only see the good and reject the bad. Because once you make that decision, God honors that decision. It's an altar call. It's a chance for God's Holy Spirit to start working in your life. It's a chance to pray and confess your sins and to be washed in the shed blood of Christ Jesus, to be renewed in your mind. The second step is to teach those children discernment, not denial. And teaching discernment is the key to the issue. 
Those are the intellectual and spiritual tools that we need to grapple with this problem. People talk about the problem and the solution they give is rearranging the furniture in your room. That is not a solution. The solution is to help the children develop discernment. The key to developing discernment is help them to form a clear biblical worldview and then to get them to understand the right questions to ask about the media to think clearly about what they're watching. When my little boy, Jamie, was five years old, he was watching a program I didn't want him to watch. It was called Masters of the Universe. I told him to turn it off. And lo and behold, when I went in to pack, I could hear it back on. I ran into the room. I looked at him. He looked very cute. And I gave him a spanking and told him to turn it off again, which he did. But there was something about the way he looked at me, this little mischievous look that I knew that he was going to turn it back on as soon as I took my bags out the door. And I prayed and I asked God what I should do. And he said, well, you were head of the TV department. Why don't you teach him discernment? So I sat down with Jamie and I said, now, who is the protagonist? Now, he knew this game. Who is the antagonist? Who, who is the villain? Who is the hero? What is the message? He said, well, there's a witch in this program and there are demons in it. And I don't want to watch this. Three days later, I came back from my trip, just like this short trip that I've taken now. And he wasn't watching. He was playing with his toys. Three years later, he was asked to be in a Georgia State University course for the children that are at the top of their class. And now my oldest son has been chosen by Duke University. He's only 13 years old in a math class for advanced uh, students who take the SATs. Not because of their IQ, but because they've taught to think clearly and discerningly. Whenever they watch a program, which is very seldom, I have them write a review of that program so they can ask the 15 basic questions that relate to understanding what that program is all about. So one, you have to understand the problem. Two, you have to make a decision that you're no longer going to support the bad. You're only going to support the good. Three, you have to teach your children discernment, and we have the tools available, whether it's through Movie Guide, which is a family guide to movies and entertainment. It'll give you all the tools you need to develop discernment. We have books about it. We should do a whole seven-hour tape course with Dr. Cole on asking the right questions and developing discernment. But the tools are there. You don't have to feel helpless and lost. And then the next point would be to help us to continue to lobby Hollywood to help us to continue to go in and meet with the Ted Turners, to not be like the church in 1966, which threw up its hands and said, $36,000 a year is too much, we can't afford that, and retreated from Hollywood, but to equip us so that we can go in to take every thought captive. We want to set up mountaintop seminars where I get people who have been open to the gospel, like Michael Eisner and others, to come and meet with uh, somebody like uh, Dr. Cole to understand how they can change their lives. Rupert Murdoch, who accepted Christ at a Campus Crusade event five years ago, but is afraid to go to church because he's going to get pressured by all the other producers. He needs discipling. So those are the different points that you can do to change your life. This is a critical issue. And what I want to ask once more is how many of you will make a commitment to reject the bad and to only see the good? Let's stand up for everybody who makes a commitment to change their life and to teach their children discernment and to take control of their thought life from now on and to stop being conformed to the images of Hollywood.